Dear friends in Jesus, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our sermon text this evening from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 18. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he ruled for 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abby, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, like everything that his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred memorial stones, cut down the Asherah poles, and broke into pieces the bronze serpent which Moses had made, because until those days the people of Israel had been burning incense to it. They called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, and there was no one like him among the kings of Judah, before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord. He did not turn aside from following him, but he kept the command which the Lord commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. Wherever he went, the Lord gave him success. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He struck down the Philistines all the way to Gaza and its territory, from watchtower to fortified city. The word of the Lord. Dear friends, well, how are you doing with all of that Christmas music ringing in your ears? Maybe you turn to that station with the all too familiar sounds becoming all too more familiar, whether by Mariah Carey or Bing Crosby or, or whoever else. The weather outside is frightful, or uh, let it snow, or uh, whatever your example may be of your favorite Christmas song. But I'm willing to wager that most of you haven't been singing the one that's been floating around in, in my head this week as I was sort of figuring out King Hezekiah. There's chapters upon chapters, not just in Second Kings, but also Second Chronicles and the prophet Isaiah, who is alive and prophesying during this time. I bet you weren't thinking about 90s smash hit by Smashing Pumpkins. Despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in the cage. Anyone thought about that song in a while? Despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in the cage. What does that mean? Well, the band, whoever wrote that song, was talking about how it's really annoying to be stuck up in the rat race of society and, and all of the, the different things that you have to fulfill as a member of society, and I rage against that. I, I experience angst and frustration about being a part of that, but still I get sucked right back in and I'm a part of society, I have to function. So despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in the cage. And I thought of that song this week because some of the sources pointed to a source outside of the Bible, a prism that was found in 1830 in Nineveh, and it was, it was inscribed by someone that was writing for Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, that we, we heard in verse 7, that uh, Hezekiah wasn't going to serve anymore. He wasn't going to be part of his feudal system and pay tribute to him anymore. Because this is what he said. He said, Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. Okay, not a rat in a cage, but a bird, a caged bird. He also said, and thus I diminished his land. He says, as for Hezekiah, the terrifying splendor of my majesty overcame him. Well, that's striking because you know what he doesn't say? Unlike 46 other cities in the town of Judah that he bragged about invading and conquering and all the gold and all of the riches that he brought back to his home in Assyria, he didn't say that he conquered Jerusalem. And this was the king boasting about himself. He couldn't quite say that he invaded. And what's remarkable about this is that it lines up once again, secular history and outside sources line up so neatly with what the Bible have to tell us. In this instance, 702 B.C., so about 700 years before Jesus Christ, 
Because what the Bible tells us is one of two very monumental, fantastic, beautiful, faithful prayers that Hezekiah speaks that's recorded for us in Scripture is against this Assyrian enemy who has surrounded Jerusalem, who's tried to starve them out. And they get this taunting, insulting letter from Sennacherib's general. Hezekiah lays it out before the altar of the Lord. He, he spreads the, the letter out and he prays that God would help him. And overnight, the angel of the Lord puts to death 185,000 of the soldiers in that Assyrian army. The same Assyrian army that just a few years before this had conquered the northern kingdom and carried them all away, scattered them never to be seen again, threatened to destroy the southern kingdom of Judah and the line of David with it. But as it turned out, God had other ideas. And not the least of which was putting the kind of faith in this King Hezekiah to seek after him, devote himself, and turn the hearts of the people to him. So this is God's answer. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David my servant. You might say, well, wait a minute. Why didn't Sennacherib complain about those 185 thousand soldiers he was probably embarrassed and when you're inscribing things on prisms for years to come you don't want to put down the embarrassing details but you might not be able to brag about everything you wish you could after all it's just beautiful to look into this history this is 80 years after what we talked about Sunday so in the past three days you've you've transported 80 years into the future four generations some kind of meh kings Kings who could have been very helpful, very useful, were partly good, but also didn't really do what needed to be done as king to devote the hearts of the people to the Lord. And then you get this really awful king, this time not Ahab, his name is Ahaz, which means possessing, instead of Jehoahaz, like some names, possessing Jehovah, possessing the Lord. This was possessing, and, and what Ahaz really wanted was the throne, and he did some pretty awful things, and that was Hezekiah's father. Well, the kingdom was so glad to have Hezekiah. There were so many good things about him that we hear that after Hezekiah, there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor before. Long live King Hezekiah. You can just hear the crowds, you can hear the throngs saying, long live King Hezekiah because they've never seen faith like this in a monarch, not in their living days. In order to give you an understanding of how good Hezekiah was, we do have to back up and show you a little bit about how bad Ahaz was, his father. He didn't do anything to give his son any proper training. Ahaz was an idolater. It says he walked in the ways of the kings of northern Israel. He offered various sacrifices to various gods. He put altars on every street corner and they had incense on every hill to some other god, and they continued the false worship from before. Apparently, they were still worshiping. They still had that, brand, that bronze serpent from 800 years before when Moses brought the people out of Egypt. They still had that bronze serpent, and time and time again, from time to time, they would worship that bronze serpent, sort of like people who maybe bow down to relics today. But it, it was even worse than that. Hezekiah probably would have had other brothers, but a couple of them weren't around, at least a couple of them, because we're told that Ahaz sacrificed his sons in the fire. And the God we know of from, from those days who did that was Molech. So child sacrifice, altars on every street corner, shut down the temple, rearranged the outside of the temple so they could worship like the Syrians from the north, and it was the worship life of the people, the faith of the people had deteriorated so badly that when Hezekiah, Hezekiah came on the scene, you have to wonder, where did he get this faith? Where did it come from? A comparable figure in the New Testament could be Timothy. Timothy had his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice. Remember that? Well, we find out in this story about um, and, and sometimes we haven't touched on this as much as we should, but we get the names of the mothers of some of these kings, and it seems to be like something the people who were reading this back when would have understood and, and maybe knew a little bit about that woman. Well, it turns out this abbey, 
her name, Abby, was short for Abijah. Um, and her father, Zechariah, must have brought Hezekiah up in the faith. And how many wonderful mothers and, and grandmothers and grandfathers have extended themselves to that point to help the grandchildren out? Well, it helped a whole old nation. And Hezekiah took his faith to the bank. There's a reason this time of year we don't sing, O Asherah tree, O Asherah tree. It's because Hezekiah took his axe and saw, and he brought them down. And along with those Asherah trees, all of those stones and, and the worship that was devoted, um, and in fact deified sexual indulgence, he broke things into pieces like that bronze serpent. He brought it down. A reminder of God's mercy toward the rebellious people is what that snake was supposed to be. But in the end, it ended up distracting them from the truth. We're told Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. The gods of the heathen natures had a knack for changing the minds of the people. But the words of the Lord are sure. And Hezekiah recognized that. He knew that if he relied, if he rested on the words of God, that he would never be disappointed. Um, he abolished the form of Jehovah worship that was on the high places. Sometimes we hear about good kings who put aside, who tear down the high places to Asherah, but they leave up the high places that were really um, unapproved worship to Jehovah. He took those down too. And no one before him had done that all the way back to the time of King Solomon. So he gets that special praise of being unequally devoted to the Lord. Not Asa, not Jehoshaphat, not Joash. No one before him had been like this. He repaired the temple. He brought back in the furnishings and opened it up, reinstituted the sacrifices and the services. And he and his officials were the first ones to bring in dozens of animals as a sin offering. They brought back the Passover and the people feasted and worshiped the Lord. They even confessed their faith in the great Messiah whom God would send to pay for their sins and to reconcile them to himself. David's psalms, Asaph's psalms were known among the people again and they sang them because Hezekiah realized his primary task was to lead the people back to keeping their covenant with God. Despite all the rage, Hezekiah was free of the cage of idolatry. What are you doing in the cage? Are you threatened at all by outside forces that would take your sanctified faith down if they could? You know your sinful nature grimaces and scowls at the good things that God does at your hands with the good thoughts and the good will that flows from your heart freely by faith alone, knowing that you're saved. You have challenges every day and maybe you look back on this short, the first half of this week already, and you say, well, I guess I really haven't been Hezekiah. I haven't gone about my faith royally. Maybe I've royally messed up. This is good advice. This is good for us to see if we simply, if we know what to do, but we simply need the courage to step out and do it the strength of faith that comes from God's word and his sacraments. We might say, oh, maybe we, just, maybe we just need a little bit extra, like another friend, and then I'll, I'll actually jump on this temptation and fight it. Or maybe I just need the right conditions and then I'll witness my faith. Or maybe I just need a little more time and then God will give me the strength next week, maybe after Christmas. But Hezekiah didn't wait. He threw off the yoke of the Assyrians and things got really good for God's people. And as it turned out, a little more time didn't end up being very good, not very helpful. Hezekiah did hold fast to the Lord, meaning he and the Lord, they were inseparable. When any person, especially a mighty ruler, clings this closely, this tightly to the Lord, that's something to treasure and to cherish because not, it doesn't happen in every generation among the rulers of the people. His political policy was to have no policy. He simply trusted in the Lord and followed where the finger of the Lord pointed in his law and in his word and in the covenant promises of the coming Messiah. And so the line of David was preserved. 
But if there was a problem for Hezekiah, if there was anything wrong here, it was honestly that he lived a little too long. Maybe you know the story. What happened about, oh, 14 years into Hezekiah's reign was he got sick. And the prophet Isaiah came to him and he said, you're never going to get up out of this sick bed. You're going to die. And then Isaiah left the palace, almost. Hezekiah turned to the wall and he said that second really great prayer that scripture records from Hezekiah for us and he asks for a longer life. And the Lord was pleased with that prayer because before Isaiah got out of the palace courts, God had him turn around and go back up and tell him, you get 15 more, more years. The Lord has heard your prayer. And I'll give you a sign. Do you want the shadow on the steps to go forward 10 steps or backward 10 steps? It's basically a, a time change. And, and Hezekiah said, it, it wouldn't be that great to make it go forward 10 steps. I wanted to go backward 10 steps. And God performed that miraculous sign for him. And he lived another 15 years. People heard about that. People as far and wide throughout the, the whole known world as Babylon. And the Babylonians actually sent delegates because they heard about that miracle. They wanted to ask him about it. And then Hezekiah got a little proud. And he did not give God the credit for that miracle. Seems like he somehow took credit for that miracle with these Babylonian envoys. And he started showing them things. He showed them the treasures of all the kingdom, including the treasury of the royal palace. And the envoys left, and Isaiah came in and said, what did you do? He said, this was not pleasing to the Lord. You're not going to, you're not going to pay for that mistake, for that sin. But the Lord is going to take all of those treasures that you showed, and your subjects are going to suffer. And it took a little over 100 years for that to happen. But guess who swept in and dragged away a bunch of people from the southern kingdom along with the treasury and all the goods and eventually destroyed the temple? Well, it was the Babylonians. Come on, Hezekiah. We were so close. We were, we were this close to being a, from a good king to a perfect king. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how the mighty have fallen and how pride goes before the fall? It's amazing even now when our lives of sanctification go well and the Lord extends us and gives us comfort here on earth how things are. We're still on sinful earth. Long life isn't really the answer. And next week, the Lord could have already come back and brought us home to heaven. Now, he absolutely, 100% has forgiven your sins of punting the ball when it took courage to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord and be, like, be a good king like Hezekiah, be, to pattern yourself after your Savior. But what it really took to pay for those sins, and the, the glorious truth this evening is that Jesus, that infant babe, infant lowly on Christmas Eve, didn't live a long life. His life was cut short when his enemies hacked him and pinned him up and got upset about him and jealous simply for being a perfect teacher and an innocent redeemer and a lover of souls, for telling the truth that the true Son of God didn't bring long life as the answer, but a life that paid for our wrongdoing. And that took courage. That took a great deal of prayer and hard work and effort for the times when we didn't. We thank the Lord for Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, because as good as things may be going here, despite all our rage, we're still just a rat in the cage of this world of sin. Jesus, we're not always doing so well down here, and we need you. We need you to come home and take us to be with you just as you came the first time, only this time with power and this time with strength, with this time glory and eternal life, life everlasting. In the name of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, amen. Please stand.